Enchanted Travelers. Welcome back to Tales from the Enchanted Forest with your hosts, Fox and Sparrow. Hello, everyone. We're so happy to have you back in the Enchanted Forest. It's been a while since we've last gotten together, and because it's been a while, I actually haven't really had time to catch up with Fox yet. So we're just trying this new thing on the podcast where, with our busy lives, we get to catch up a bit on the podcast. Uh, so, Fox, what are you currently up to? What are your current obsessions? So, this is going to sound like a targeted ad, but it's not <laughs> because this game has been out for ages. So, and I don't think they have any budget for new content or for marketing. So, I'm safe there. But I have recently been obsessed with Animal Crossing uh, and specifically New Horizons. There's something about the beginning of a season, like when outside is hitting just like that right level of seasonal aesthetic so at the moment here it's very colorful and it's nice and chilly and there's a good amount of rain so there's nothing better to do besides curl up and make your island basically (laughs) as aesthetically pleasing as possible but usually it's just like the entrance area and so my entrance area is fantastically fall But once you head a little bit further in, it's all flat Um, (laughs) or it's all random because I like to redo the same section over and over and over again. And that's kind of how I play this game. But at the moment, I just love the fall stuff. I love that the trees change color. I love that you can have so many different pumpkin decorations out. And I'm on a campaign to try and give my different villagers outfits, like Halloween outfits they can wear. Mm-hmm. It's not working because everyone's wearing the stupid baby bib, so like the silicone baby bib outfit. And I think it's a hate crime towards my aesthetic, to be honest. It's just not a good outfit. It, there are a couple outfits in the game. Like, why do you exist? The The bane of my existence is the towel robe that all my villagers like to wear. And I just, <sighs> I always go up to Isabel and like, please make them stop. I really like this character, but they need to stop dressing this way. It is... We have a dress code here. It's not working. It's not this. It's also, I'm like, this is indecent. I've given you so many good clothes. I've given, I remember I had to get rid of, I can't remember what the pig was. Hugh, I think, the blue pig. But I had to get rid of him because one, I didn't have Happy Home Paradise yet and his house was a disaster. But two, Mm. I kept giving him really cute outfits, really cute sweaters And he just kept wearing the same ugly t-shirt and I hated it. I thought it was just like, (laughs) I was like, you you can't live here anymore. Get off. That sounds so shallow, but you can't live here. I feel like everyone, it's like a running joke in the the community that, (laughs) well, at least my husband thinks I'm insane because I'll go into the campsite or I'll go in villager hunting and I'll be like, I can't have this person. They're ugly. And then he's like, it's the cutest little like unibrow squirrel. And I'm like, uh not on my island it's true i normally am not like i don't judge people like for the way they like dress and stuff in real life but the moment it comes to like pokemon or animal crossing i get super hardcore judgmental and like you're not cute enough to join my party you're not like aesthetically pleasing enough to be on my island like no thank you it's really a weird (laughs) shift (laughs) and i can see how he might be a little judgy but teach their own but there's not much to do on Animal Crossing anymore besides change my aesthetic every season. So I am putting the final touches on my fall-themed island, trying to stay away from Instagram suggestions because it keeps showing me all of these modded switches, which have really cool things that you can do. Oh. And I don't live dangerously enough to have a modded switch for some reason. But I love the <laughs> tantalite. It's like a, it's a siren song because they have these really beautiful willow trees and these flowers and these super cute little like tree houses. And I want them, Aww. but not enough to, to, to risk modding my switch. So I'm trying to stay away from that because every time I see something, I get so envious. I'm like, I want that random tree house. It's the, it's the only thing I want now and I can't have it. So I'm going to have to make like a janky version of it. When you're done with this current aesthetic version, can you put like a picture or two up on our website or Twitter? Yeah. Yeah, I will. So we can see it. I want to see it. Yes. If anyone is interested in seeing my endeavors, 
Uh, I will show you the, the two really nice photos <laughs> from the entrance. And then the rest of the island uh, will just pretend like it's made up. <laughs> but yes, that is my current obsession. And then as soon as I'm done, of course, it'll be winter season. So I'll have to take down all my pumpkins and probably get rid of them because storage space. And then I'll have to put up all my Christmas stuff. I love the, the holiday season on Animal Crossing. It's such a fun mood. I haven't found any other game really that does it as well, I think. Even Stardew Valley, which is a very close second to coziness, I think it's the festivals just don't have the same kind of running back and forth and tasks and doing things, I think, that I like about Animal Crossing. And I think it's just like part of the build up. Like every day you get that one piece of candy or whatever. And then mm-hmm. eventually it's like treat day what do they call it is it halloween i don't think they call it they call it spooky day or something uh treat day or candy day like they give it a a special name and there's like turkey day instead of thanksgiving like i love all just the little cutesy names they put in lieu of the actual holiday anyways very good game glad glad you're back into it i'm really excited because i will probably ignore it for the rest of the season and then take it back up are you still playing i want to say baldur's gate Yes, I am still knee deep in that. I'm like in act two. For those of you who have played the game, like there's a lot of spooky, creepy elements in the game, but I and I haven't played act three yet, so I can't say like if act three is worse or not, but act two definitely feels like the worst. Like this feels like there's so many creepy things and I'm so easily freaked out. Like I never watch horror movies or anything. And there's a lot of things I'm just like so uncomfortable with. So I'm like, please, nothing, jump out and kill me. Please just let me get through this area without being scarred, please, guys. (laughs) And so it's been a really fun just slowly creeping through, but also trying to like run through it as fast as I can because I'm like, everything is freaking me out. But I love the role play aspect. I really love the game mechanics. Um... So that's still ongoing, but the besides when I'm playing that, the other thing that I've been really into, I've been watching Dimension 20's The Unsleeping City, and for those of you who don't know, Dimension 20 is a D&D, like, let's play show, essentially, where a bunch of comedians playing uh, D&D, and they make a story out of it uh, while playing the game, and it's really fun. So The Unsleeping City is, like, the idea, what if we were playing D&D, but it was in New York? So, like, they have a paladin who is uh, the firefighter, so New York's finest, you know? Um, or not finest, that's the, the police. New York's bravest. I'm not from New York. I don't know these things. And they have, like, a nurse who's the cleric. They have, uh, like, a Broadway singer, their bard. Or they have the um, a drug dealer who is the wild magic sorcerer, which is really fun. <laughs> They're just taking drugs, then going on trips, and then magic happens. It's really funny. Anyway, so that's been really fun, and I just completed that. It's really good. Um, yeah, I know, Fox, you're not as much into watching d and It's just, it's a bit of a commitment. <laughs> I think for me, I the D&D shows, they, it, it's, it's so long, and there's so many. Mm-hmm. And honestly, with the D&D ones, I think I have so much trouble keeping, like, paying attention for long periods of time because I think so much happens and there's so many rules and then also there's so many episodes. Like, I just find there to be, I think it's overwhelming in order to figure out where to start, specifically with things like Critical Role. Yeah. But also, I'm one of the players that likes to play D&D, but not so much watch it or listen to it if it's too long, if you get what I mean yeah totally get that i would prefer playing too but just with life i've not been able to run a game or play a game in a long time so watching it kind of kind of scratches that itch for me um but if you're ever looking to get into it like if you ever like want to give it a shot i would recommend doing a dimension 20 season those are often much shorter so the i don't remember how many episodes specifically but for like unsleeping city it was like 16 episodes but like for you, I'd recommend the Escape from the Blood Keep, which is essentially like a Lord of the Rings parody. So it's from the perspective of the villains. And they um it's at the point where like essentially they're equivalent to Sauron just like lost and the ring was thrown into the fire. And the, like all the villains, like the generals and stuff are like, oh, dang, what do we do? And they're just like kind of just trying to scramble. So they're like the bad guys, but they're also like 
really treat each other with respect and stuff. And they're like, no, we are going to be evil. We're going to cover the world with darkness. But um, we want to have, like, labor rights. We're going to have unions. And we're going to make sure there's sick leave. And, like, we're going to respect mothers who need, like, the time off to take care of their children. Like, <laughs> but we will conquer the world. <laughs> Unionize the bad guys. Yeah. And that's, like six episodes two hours each so that's a really i know it still sounds long but that's quite condensed uh, otherwise um or if you're wanting more like a critical role where it's like much grander like high fantasy like a part of a bigger world but just like a bite of it there's another series called the calamity which is essentially like kind of backstory to some of the bigger adventures of critical role it's four episodes they're each four hours long so kind of similar lengths to escape from the blood keep but that one's also quite fantastic if you're just looking to just give it a shot dip my toes yeah it's not for everyone but if you wanted to dip your toes those are two fantastic like bite size and you don't need anything more or less than them like with the critical role one you could go into critical role after that but that's absolutely not necessary like there's no cliffhanger ending where it's like well what happens next it's like it's done we can move on <laughs> you know <laughs> Um, so yeah, anyways, that's my little tangent on D&D shows. Um, and yeah, I really liked Unsleeping City. And is it, so do they have voice actors? Because one thing I do enjoy, like the idea, sorry, because I don't really watch Critical Role, but one thing I enjoy the idea of is voice actors. Yes. Critical Role, it's all voice actors. So they all develop unique voices for their characters. If you watch the whole campaign all the way through, you would notice like the first five or 10 episodes, like they're kind of tweaking the voice, developing it. But then after that, they're fairly consistent with their voice. The only exception is like the first campaign where clearly one of the guys didn't think this was going to be a thing or a long term thing. So he's just using his normal voice. So there's even at one point it's called out. They're like, say this in your Scanlan voice. And he's like, it is my actual voice. What do you want me to do? I can't do this differently. <laughs> It's like when a character is named Greg or Tom in a magical world. So, yeah, all of them are voice actors. All of them do uh, fun stuff. If you go to Dimension 20, there's a little bit of that. It's not as much. These are usually comedians that they bring in. So some of them will have slight variations, but, like, I've noticed it's not as heavily into that um, as Critical Role. So it's a bit of a trade-off, but, like... They're all still good. It's just a little different and it kind of depends on what you're looking for. Yeah. And if you're not into all of that, but interested in fantasy stuff, you can definitely check out The Legends of Vox Machina, which is the animated version of Critical Role's first campaign. Um, and that's pretty fun. Yes, I do actually. So I, I do actually enjoy that one. I think it makes for a really good animated series, but also mm -hmm. it's a nice tie in to I think it's only one campaign they cover per season, right? No. So the first, there's two seasons of the Legend of Vox Machina right now, and that covers mm -hmm. like the first two arcs of the campaign. Technically, oh, they okay. cut out the first arc because they came in halfway through when they started streaming it. Um, so I think I would have to go back and check, but I think the, the guess is if they continue at the pace they're going at, there's going to be the two to three more seasons of Vox Machina, and they've already announced the animated series for The Mighty Nine, which is the second campaign. So that one will get started up soon, um, which I'm really excited about that one. I'm sure you'll enjoy the animated stuff more, but if you ever wanted to, there's a lot of different fun stuff um, in the, the Let's Play as well. But that is such a commitment. I would never, <laughs> never tell anyone <laughs> <laughs> to go do it unless they were just really wanted to. It's good. It's just oh, a time sink. I'm sure people listen to it the way I watch reality TV, which is like in the background. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much how I do it. The first few episodes I have to just sit and watch just to get like the vibe of the campaign or whatever. And then I would just listen to it in the background. So I think it would be good, like, if you are someone that likes to listen to things in the background just to have noise, I feel like this is one of those shows that maybe some people do it the same way that I do reality TV, where I just want to hear the chatter. Mm -hmm. Not an iPad kid, but I'm a TV in the background <laughs> kid. Yeah, it's, 
Yeah, and it's just like because there's so much content, it just keeps going. Like you don't have to stop and think, okay, I've caught up. I mean, I'm at the point where I've caught up now. I'm like, okay, now what? <laughs> um, and my answer has <laughs> apparently been play Baldur's Gate and watch another D and D show. I'm doing everything but playing D and D right now. It's I need to, we need to play another <laughs> short campaign at some point. <laughs> Just help me scratch that itch. Isn't Baldur's Gate like D&D, though? So I feel like you are kind of playing D&D, just without the social aspect. Yeah, it, so it is D&D. It's all the D&D rule set. So if you play it, you'll you'll get a lot of it. In fact, you might know enough about D&D where you'll actually be going, mm, this spell is missing. Why don't I have dispel magic? And it's because they're like, it's too complicated to put in the game, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> so. And I'm like, no, I want it. I know how to use this spell. I'm just like, I wanted to spell this so bad. Uh, so yeah, if you play it, like you'll actually very quickly understand the rule set because it is just D&D, but video gamified. And they've done a really good job with mm-hmm. it. But like, I miss sitting around the table. I miss rolling real dice and like just the, the craziness that Aww. comes out of those situations. Like, this is good, but like you can't really ever top the moment where someone's like "Mm -hmm, mm-hmm mm-hmm i pull out a gun now and it's like you had a gun when did you have a gun (laughs) and we were having a peaceful conversation like you you know it's just like (laughs) you can't replace other people at the table coming up with really crazy things in the moment this has been my like D D rant everyone thank you for listening to my rant slash ted talk um (laughs) i'll just put my soapbox away now (laughs) And now back to regular scheduled programming. <laughs> Thank you all for letting us catch up a bit. That's kind of what we're currently into. Um, but today we have a rather interesting story. Fox, you want to take it away? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we found this story in a book titled Moriland Fairy Tales by Edith House, and it was published in 1913. So Edith was born in England but moved to New Zealand when she was very young and she would go on to be an author and school teacher in New Zealand. When she was teaching, she realized that there was a lack of fairy stories or stories that would help children's learning and development, so she began writing some. With that said, it is not clear if this story is an exact retelling of an actual Maori myth or folklore However, it is clear that it is definitely inspired by the folklore of New Zealand. And genuinely, we just really liked the story. We thought it was quite interesting. I think the characters are interesting when you have two maidens who are friends and there's no romantic connection because we've done a lot of romantic stories recently. Um, And so we thought that it would be something to look into. If you are looking for some more genuine myths or credited myths we have some that we're going to talk about at the end as well as some that are on the website so without further ado let us recount the tale of how the moon was made once upon a time long before there was a moon in the sky there were two beautiful maidens who were best friends so there's a little bit of a good news bad news situation with these girls names The bad news is the story doesn't say what exactly the original names were. We have the meaning of the names, but not the name itself. The good news is that the audio listeners here don't have to listen to us mispronounce what I'm sure were absolutely beautiful names. One girl's name meant shining eyes, and the other's name meant rippling hair. And that is how we'll be referring to them throughout the tale. Now, shining eyes had heard many tales of the fire that never goes out. This was a special kind of fire that is kept in one of the underworlds and is guarded by fierce spirits. She believed that if they could get that fire, they would have life that never dies. She thought nothing would be better than giving the gift of unending life for the whole world. One day, Shining Eyes approached Rippling Hair and asked if she would join her on a quest to look for the fire that never goes out. Rippling Hair was concerned. She told her that the journey would be very dangerous, not to mention they would have to get by the fierce spirits that guarded it. They would be lucky to return alive. Shining Eyes grins and tells her she has a plan. She explains that 
If they bring a basket of kumaras, also known as sweet potatoes, to the spirits, they would be so distracted by the taste of the sweet fruit that they would be able to take the fire and get out. Rippling Hair wasn't so convinced this would work. She also didn't think their fathers would even let them go on a journey so dangerous. But Shining Eyes reassured her that they were swift runners and they didn't need to tell their families the truth of where they were going. I like how the solution to her concerns is the same as the answer for a heist. Move quickly and lie. <laughs> Don't look anyone in the eye. Just lie your way through it and we'll get to the underworld. I'm imagining as she's explaining this plan, it's like an Ocean's Eleven like cut to examining how they're going to get by their fathers or they're going to go into the woods to get there, like, you know spy style i mean it does it does remind me of the scene in merlin where he's like distract the guards and then merlin knocks them all out and then when arthur comes back he's like not not like that but it's like but i knocked i distracted them they're unconscious can't get more distracted i would like to quickly note here that in um some of the maori myths and folklore the underworld isn't so much a place just for the dead so the way that we would think like as a western society we would think underworld ah like hell or we would make connotations to maybe Hades and the underworld in Greek mythology. The underworld here is more of just like a spiritual place where gods and spiritual heroes and other kind of demigods can exist. So it's not just a place for the dead and the dead spirits but also for kind of more mystical and peaceful things as well. Also when we're talking about the underworld I think it's kind of interesting how we have the the two girls as the main characters and then the underworld is ruled by the goddess of death and night so it's another female character so it's just interesting how female centric this story is in a way yeah you don't see that a whole ton if there's female characters they're either the the princess needs to be saved or it's like the old woman who sends the the guy on his quest at the beginning um or sometimes they get to be the villain. Or the lover who's going to go save her prince. There's also that trope. This is just two girls who are like best friends. We're like, yo, we're going to go do something. And it's just going to be fun. And they're kind of, they're doing it for like selfish, selfless reasons. They're like, we're going to do this for everybody, not just for ourselves. Exactly. They're, they're breaking a lot of stereotypes. And I'm here for it. <laughs> we're like ah oh, you're doing it for the entire world and not for selfish reasons who is this what is this story right it's <sighs> i like these girls a lot we should make a list on our website at some point being like here are the surprisingly really cool females that we have found in fairy tales like aisha yeah exactly i was remembering you brought up aisha and then i gave her enough crap and you were like what the heck back off I'm like you don't we don't give this energy to the male heroes although we do we, we we have the same energy for the males basically we don't like stupid people and females can be stupid males can be stupid a lot of fairy tales nowadays when you dissect them don't make sense and that's okay that's part of the fun mm -hmm. but so far these two haven't done anything yeah so far they've just been a lot of talk right now they're just like what if mm -hmm. we did a heist and I'm here for that <laughs> Rippling Hair heard Shining Eyes' idea of how to kind of make this all work, but Shining Eyes could see the uncertainty in her friend's eyes. So she held her hands and said she had been thinking about this for a really long time and she was going to go. But Rippling Hair should not come if her heart fails her, for she does not want to lead her into danger. Before she could say anything else, Rippling Hair cried out and said that she would always go with her wherever she would go. So the two girls tell their families that they are traveling to a neighboring village and begin to pack for the journey. They pack food for the road in a basket of sweet potatoes for the spirits. Their journey began pleasant with a sunny rolling hills. But once they came to the dark bramble forest, things got a lot more challenging. You see, the forest along with its denizens knew why the girls were on their journey and they did everything in their power to make the girls turn back. The treetops blocked out the sun so that the girls got lost. The brambles curled towards them, tearing at them till they bled. Birds and insects stole their food, hoping that their hunger would drive them away. And these plants and animals tell the girls the same thing. 
turn back before it's too late. Despite all of this, they did not lose heart and traveled on foot for many days. Eventually, they arrived at a great tree fern and decided to rest there for the night. They were very tired and sore from the journey, and they were eager for a good night's sleep. They were also very, very hungry, but they had no food left besides the kumaras that they had saved for the spirits. While they were drifting off to sleep, forest fairies watched them and they marveled at the girls' courage. They knew the forest had done its best to stop them, but they have continued on all the same. Perhaps the courage they possessed would guide them safely through their journey. So the fairies agreed that they would help them. Carefully, the fairies picked up the sleeping girls and brought them to the fairy palace and gently laid them in the softest beds. When they awoke in the morning, the fairies brought enchanted food and drink that fully rejuvenated them. This sounds kind of amazing. Where do I sign Mm -hmm. up for this fairy palace Airbnb? I mean, it's going to come with a lot of cleaning fees. Oof. Besides that, I'm sure it'd be very affordable. I, I mean... That sounds like a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Not to mention the vetting process, which is the fairies must like you. And fairies are kind of... I'm still in the the fairies are suspicious phase of my life, so... I just think it's really funny because I'm just imagining fairies the size of Tinkerbell all just trying to lift up these two girls (laughs) and just like an army of them like, one, two, three, lift! Ah! Ah! I mean, I'm sure they use magic, but that's what I'm imagining. (laughs) They're trying to figure out how to maneuver them and everything in the place is really tiny, like in Alice in Wonderland. So they're trying to figure out what to do. Yeah, the softest beds were just like a bunch of leaves that they had to find last minute. They were like, yeah, we got nothing else. Like, nothing fits you. (laughs) Again, cleaning fees, service fees. And then the host, the fairies, will give them like a 4.5 star review or like a 3 star review for leaving a mess. Didn't take out the trash on their way out. I don't know. I'm still kind of tempted. How about we we go on a journey one of these days? That doesn't that sound fun? Not with Airbnb. <laughs> I'm very jaded. <laughs> oh no. All right. Well, maybe maybe we'll find another fairy palace that's not Airbnb. That's just a regular hotel, and we'll see. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> you know what actually sounds quite nice? The dragon. Do you remember the dragon from um, the Flower Maiden? Oh yeah. That sounded like a good time. Ooh. That Okay, that's an Airbnb I would happily pay the crazy cleaning fees for because she had a ball every night. Okay, let's talk about another list we need on our website. The best <laughs> Airbnbs. We also have the Troll Bridge. And move aside, Zillow. <laughs> the Enchanted Forest Real Estate Agency is here. Yes, we we just like review like places to stay as long as they're not real. Um, see who is the best host, you know. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of give it all the stars. That would be fun. <laughs> it's a good thing they got such a good rest because after they went on their way, they had to cross the mountain land, and the mountain land didn't get the memo that these girls were unstoppable. Little bumps grew into tall mountains beneath their feet. Chasms grew before them. Storms roared all around them, and a mountain giant even showed up at one point. But none of this could stop the girls who relentlessly marched on. Eventually, the mountain did recognize their courage and let them pass through safely. Finally, they came to the edge of a cliff with a beautiful tree with crimson flowers overlooking the sea. Shining Eyes recognized this and told Rippling Hair that it must be spray-sprinkled. The roots of the tree extended all the way down the cliff face to the rocky beach below. Between the lowest roots lies an entrance to the underworld. Each night, the souls who have died that day come to the top of this tree, look upon the world one last time, sigh, and then fling themselves off into the underworld below. Shining Eyes says, if they can save their friends by preventing them from this suffering of a sad end, it will all have been worth it. And we kind of spoke about this a little bit before, but like this is where it's really spelt out that their goal for their journey here is not just for them to have life that doesn't end, but it's for the whole Mm -hmm. world to have this. And that's quite different and unique. And I quite love that. Um, 
we've talked about a couple tales before where it's immortality, but I think it's always just been for themselves. Um, I think the last one that we spoke of was probably, and again, I'm so sorry for the pronunciation, Chung, I think it was, uh, and actually this makes, it was the Mid-Autumn Festival with Chunga and the, I guess it was the moon spirit, or there, I remember her husband, Howie, had the elixir of immortality that he received because he shot down some of the suns that were burning up the earth, and then she ended up taking the immortality potion instead. And in, I think, two of the variants, she took, once she took it because um, her husband's enemy was trying to take it and then become immortal and then take over the world, and so she took it to prevent him from taking it. And in another one, she took it because her husband had become a tyrant and she didn't want him to have it. Mm. So it's kind of like she took the immortality, but it wasn't for a selfish reason. It was to prevent a greater evil. And then, of course, she was sent up to live on the moon. So that was a fun consequence of her immortality. But I'm trying to think and I don't really I don't really remember any where they do it for the entire world. Like everyone gets to be immortal and everyone gets to benefit from their actions. And I think the only one we have with the moon is probably the man on the moon and Chunga, of course. So I don't really... At least I can't think of any. If we have any that we're forgetting travelers, please do tell us. (laughs) Because (laughs) at this point, it's exciting to say that we have too many episodes to remember all of them. So I think I need to take it as a point of pride that we don't remember every single episode. (laughs) It's true. We have actually been doing this for for a while now. So this is really exciting that we kind of can look back at like our backlog of episodes. Because I think we are also forgetting another instance of immortality, like elixir or something played a somewhat significant role in the story. But I just I can't think of it right now. Um, So I'll have to go back into the backlog and see what we've done. Um, If we (laughs) find them, we'll link them on the show notes. Yes, of course. So, they rested that evening, and when morning came, they began the descent by the roots into the opening of the underworld. They went down the pitch-black, narrow passage, trembling with each careful step. After what felt like a long time, they saw a light up ahead, and they began to pick up the pace. The passage led to an open area illuminated by fire made of three sticks crossed. In front of the fire were three fierce old spirits. Shining eyes excitedly whispered, It's the fire that never goes out. Hand me the kumara. The girls tried to approach silently, but the spirits quickly heard them and shouted, Mortals! as they turned towards them. Shining Eyes pivoted and handed the bask of Kumara to the spirit. She says that they have come to bring the spirits earth fruits and that none so sweet could be found down here. Surprised by the girl's bravery, the spirits accepted the Kumara from her and began to taste the fruit of the earth. While they were crowded around the Kumara, Shining Eyes quickly snatched the fire stick and fled with rippling hair to the passage they came from. Before they could reach it, They heard a shriek from the spirits as they realized they had been tricked. With the light from the fire, they swiftly dashed through the passage, but the spirits were gaining on them. Finally, rippling hair sprang through the exit and then turned to see a spirit had caught shining eyes by her heel. Rippling hair grabbed her friend's hand and tried to pull her out, but she could not free her. She pleaded with bright eyes, drop the fire and give me your other hand. But Shining Eyes did not want to lose this chance for unending life. Gritting her teeth, she held the fire stick tightly before tossing it high into the sky. Rippling Hair grabbed the free hand and yanked her friend out of the spirit's grip and onto the beach. Thankfully, the spirits didn't dare leave the underworld, so they fled back down the passage in a rage. Out of breath, the girls laid on the beach, panting, trying to make sense of what had just happened. Amazed to be alive, the fire that Shining Eyes tossed continued to go higher into the sky, and it spun faster until it was a ball of light. It's at this point that the Sky Father noticed this and caught this ball of light. He placed the ball into a small part of the night sky and told the North Wind to pass on a message to the two girls. 
He told them that unending life is not for the people of the earth, but their brave deed has not been for nothing. The fire that never goes out shall stay in the sky and provide light when the sun is away. By its light, people will be able to see where to walk when before there would only be darkness. Now return home and know that people will forever be blessed for the good deed you have done. Hearing this message, the girls were comforted, even though they lost the fire stick. They returned home safely to their family and friends. While their wild tales surprised them, they couldn't deny the new light in the night sky, so they believed them. That light remains to this day. We call it the moon. And that is how the moon was made. I like how they went through all of that. And then the sky god, Ron Kinui, was just like, nah, yoink. It was like, good good try, girls. Like, you know, you gave the old college try, but um, I'm just going <laughs> to put that in the sky. It's going to be part of my thing now. Well, in some of the Maori myths, it's the sky god. So again, I'm not a professional pronunciator. <laughs> but it's uh, so it's Ron Ginwi, and he ends up being so in some of the myths, obviously, because there's so many different ones in some of them. He is the father of the moon and the sun, and they end up being celestial bodies that are part of the kind of mythology in others. It is the goddess of the night, who is also kind of the goddess of the moon. Something that we mentioned while we were telling the story and while we were obviously reading it is about how much feminine power there is in this story. Of course, we have the two girls and we have them on this selfless quest for the betterment of mankind. We have, and that's kind of like the Prometheus myth where you have him getting fire from the gods to give to the people. Even though it, he knows it's going to end up with him being punished, he still does it. And the girls are kind of on a similar journey to him. They're trying to do something for all of mankind. Then we also have the goddess of the underworld and of the night. And another feminine aspect is, of course, the moon. The moon is one of those celestial bodies that has always been related to feminine cycles, to feminine power. You see it in witches and the Wiccan as well, where they get their power from the moon, the moon goddess. Uh, You see it in Greek mythology with Artemis. And the masculine power is with Apollo, her brother. So it's not a shock that in some religions and obviously in some Maori myths, it is the the moon goddess is or the moon is a female Mm -hmm. or there's a female goddess that runs the moon. Even thinking of something more recently from Avatar, the last airbender series, UA is gifted some powers by like the moon spirit and at the end of like her arc she essentially becomes one with the moon and the moon spirit and she's like the embodiment of the moon as well so there's always that perpetual joke of yeah my girlfriend became the moon (laughs) from Sokka that's rough buddy we can see that that idea is in these old myths and stories but it's also kind of continued forward into modern day in terms of our modern stories as well I also think it has a lot to do with the cycles because obviously we have the female cycles. We have obviously the phases of the moon. And I think there was, there's a lot of similarities there where you have the moon going all through all of these different stages where it's waxing, it's waning. And then the same thing with the female cycle and the Maori myths, there is on the official government of New Zealand website they have an entire just kind of template but one of the things they say about the moon is that they have the moon um, associated with fertility and the cycle of life and they have these two terms called hina te ao which is female light and hina te po which is female dark and that's kind of like the pale moon and the dark moon as well so you have hina keha which is the pale moon and hina ora which is the dark moon And it's just kind of like this cycle of opening and closing of a portal through which departed spirits would return to the origin of life. So it was kind of a guide. Just like in this myth, now that they have the moon, the people aren't ruled by the darkness anymore. They can do things in the night and they can go hunting, they can go and they can go fishing. So there's lots to do with the moon here and the power of the light of the moon. Mm. And another thing. (laughs) So... When we read this story, I was very much um, like I not to like discredit Edith House, but it didn't sound 
like a Maori myth. The Maori myths are quite funny and straight. Like they're like if you've heard of them, if you've heard of Maui, which of course we all have due to Moana now. But if you've heard of the, kind of the Maui stories, they're all kind of ridiculous. They're all kind of fun. Like how he split up New Zealand. How you know he caught a giant fish. There's all these really fun Maui stories, and one story that I really like is about Rona, the woman on the moon, and again, another woman on the moon, but it's, <laughs> it's nonsensical in the sense that she was out trying to get water once, and as she was walking, the moon just went behind a couple clouds, and she ended up tripping. So her response was to curse at the moon, and the moon being, you know, this great celestial being was really mad at that. So it just reached down and just grabbed her. Another yoink <laughs> moment, but it just grabbed her right off the earth. And she tried to hold on to a tree, but she was pulled up. And so now when you look up at the sky, instead of seeing, you know, the rabbit and the pestle or the man on the moon, you see the woman on the moon, which I think is really funny. <laughs> Just imagining the moon from Majora's Mask just coming down with its big, <laughs> creepy smile, being like, I'm going to grab you. And yeah, that, that, that's just in my head. But it's it's interesting. It's another instance of like a, a woman being so correlated with the moon, along with the other stories we mentioned before. I almost want to say it's a conspiracy theory, but it's too <laughs> obvious. So it's probably not. Well... You do have some people who do ascribe to the idea of the moon is feminine because it reflects the light of the sun. Ugh. And that's like that. why the sun. I'm like, well, it's, I'm like, nope. Blech. Nope. I know that's scientifically correct, but there's, it's just that there's something very misogynistic about that. Here's the thing. I think the moon is cooler because it's more mysterious, you know? Mm hmm. That's a dark side. So, have you seen Maya and the Three? No, I have not. I have. Are you planning on watching it? <laughs> yes, it's on okay. our on our list. I will not spoil it then, but for those of you who have watched it, you know what I'm talking about. That's all I'm going to leave it at. What? I literally can't say anything because it's just a spoiler, like that I was going to talk about. Um, and I know. You you like avoiding spoilers, so yeah. I there's a connection here, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into it because it's a spoiler. I'm sorry. It's okay. I was just like, oh, this is gonna be a cool thing, and I'm like, I haven't seen that, and you're not allowed to ruin it for me. I I know how you feel about spoilers. I'm not I'm not gonna tread that ground. But what I need to ask though, because we're currently, I think, what we're watching right now is Vox Machina, but what with Maya and the three? Yes. Does it get to finish, or does Netflix cancel it before it? Unless Netflix had some plans for a second or third season uh, that I'm not aware about, um, and then canceled it without telling anybody, it it concludes in a way that doesn't really leave a door open for more. Unless you know you're getting real creative with it, Maya's story completes Perfect. so you can just go ahead and watch it it's cutesy it's definitely aimed at a younger audience and i can feel you can feel that at time to time mm -hmm. um, but it's still like a cute fun you know don't think too hard and just enjoy the romp um i recommend well i like that like i liked the owl house and that had that kind of same vibe in the beginning where mm -hmm. it was very but my biggest issue with netflix and netflix's series is that i'm just constantly paranoid that they've left it on a cliffhanger or they haven't solved the problem and then there's no second season yeah so i just i try and avoid shows that don't have the second season out yet or at least that i haven't heard that they've completely concluded because then i'm, a, I'm very sketched out like is netflix going to get me hooked on this and then cancel it and then put out another season of big mouth is the is the current trend one of my favorite discovered cartoons in the past like three to five years i absolutely adored it was on netflix and it was a victim of this where it was very clear the the designers behind it had a lot more story in them mm -hmm. they did that thing essentially where the first season or like technically two seasons i think it was very episodic 
And um, I'm very okay with the first season being episodic because I feel like it's a fun way for them to kind of test and expand characters and the world. Like you kind of can throw like a bunch of like essentially seeds of like potential things that can happen down the line and then later seasons can just build on that it's kind of like the second or third season you have to start a big story arc for me to be really invested in the show but they did Wait, the thing what are you where talking they did... about what show is this it's a show called glitch text and it's so much fun and they did that so well of every week it was completely the same characters but they were just very episodic come in each one but by the end of like the show they had very clearly built to like we are going to start a major storyline now, and then Netflix cut it, and they did not renew it, and I was so mad. Glitch uh, text. Okay, I've seen this. If you want a really fun show, I highly recommend. But if you can't take the heartbreak of the fact that there was no conclusion to it, then <sighs> yeah, I don't know what to tell you. I'm really disappointed. <laughs> You're like, I'm st- I'm still not over it. I thought, so the reason I interrupted is because I thought you were talking about um, the Netflix show with the government agency. I forgot what it was called. Kind of why I left it blank for a little while, because I'm like, a lot of people have felt this pain. For me, it's been the show Glitch Text. I could see where it was going, and it just didn't get there. <laughs> you're like, you're just going to be very, very frustrated by this, so don't watch it. <sighs> but also, I love it, and everyone should see it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah don't worry they'll just put out another series another season of rick and morty or just to summarize that show real quick it's like what if the ghostbusters were hunting down video games and that's pretty much it anyways we are so off topic now. yes i i <laughs> I've, this has been a really good story but we've just had so much to talk about <laughs> yes and the show i'm talking about was inside job and they left it on the most the most heart-wrenching conclusion and it's i'm i'm not over it and i hope netflix stocks drop because the amount of really bad content they're putting out and the amount of good content they're ignoring they need to reevaluate yeah um maybe maybe there'll be a kickstarter down the line that will revive it or something <laughs> hopefully that has been how the moon was made, plus a lot of other stuff that we're, we're really into. All right, travelers, we talked about the story, our favorite things, as well as a discussion on some feminine power. But if you're still not satisfied and you want to hear more from us, then you can come join us anytime on Twitter, also known as X, at From Enchanted. We are also on Instagram, TikTok, uh blue sky mastodon any kind of social media site that you can think of we're probably on it at tales from the enchanted forest however the most reliable place to find us will always be our website www.talesfromenchantedforest.com also if you are old school like sparrow you can email us any questions comments or suggestions at talesfromenchantedforest at gmail.com and remember there's always a place for you in the enchanted forest Thank you.